Whenever we eat foods that are high in protein, such as this uh, delicious deer sausage that I'm eating right now, our body has to take those proteins and break them down or digest them into their amino acids. We can then take those amino acids and absorb those into the villus of our small intestine and therefore into our bloodstream. Then they'll travel to the liver or our liver can reassemble those amino acids into all the different proteins that our body needs in order to function. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at that whole process from digesting the proteins into their individual amino acids and small peptides, all the way to absorbing those into the enterocytes of the villi of the small intestine and therefore into the bloodstream. So let's uh, jump to the whiteboard and get started. Mm, get me some more of that before we go. So let's start by taking a look at an intestinal villus. These are gonna be little folds in the small intestine and they're made of a couple different things. We've got enterocytes. All of these enterocytes also have something called microvilli on the surface. This is gonna increase the surface area of these absorptive cells and that increased surface area will help us to absorb more as well as digest or break down molecules more. We also have goblet cells. The goblet cells are gonna be creating a mucus layer. Now, since we're absorbing these molecules into the bloodstream, we're gonna need some arteries and veins that are running through the villus of the small intestine. So artery and vein, and then of course a capillary. The capillaries are where we're actually gonna absorb these nutrients into the bloodstream for circulation. Now that's true for the amino acids from proteins as well as the monosaccharides from the sugars that we eat. For the fatty acids from the fats that we eat, that's gonna happen in a lacteal or a lymph vessel. And there'll be one of these lacteals going up into each of the villi of the small intestine. Now I've got one villus drawn here. Of course, we have many villi in the small intestine. And so you see a second one I've got drawn in the diagram here. So here we have the enterocytes that we zoomed in on. We're gonna have a capillary that's running nearby so we can see where these molecules are gonna go. And we're taking a look at protein digestion and absorption. So let's talk about what proteins are actually gonna get broken down. The first and most obvious is gonna be the dietary proteins. These are gonna be proteins that we eat such as in the sausage that I ate in the intro of the video. But the dietary proteins that we eat actually don't account for the majority of the proteins that we're breaking down in this process. We also have proteins that are called endogenous proteins. And endogenous proteins are gonna be proteins that are already in the body that we need to kind of recycle. We need to break them back down so we can build them into new proteins and use them again. We don't wanna waste all of these proteins and amino acids and stuff that we have in the body. Those endogenous proteins come from a few different sources. One, we have all these digestive enzymes in our small intestine and digestive enzymes are actually proteins. So when we break these other proteins down, it's actually proteins breaking down other proteins. We also have some of these enterocytes or cells that are lining the small intestine that are gonna die over time as all cells do and they get sort of sloughed off into the lining of the small intestine and we'll break those down and we gotta recycle all of those proteins. And there's just other plasma proteins that kind of live in the small intestine that we're gonna be breaking down as well. So we've got all these proteins that we need to digest or break down. So let's talk about the structure of a protein in general. Now proteins, of course, are gonna be chains of amino acids. They're gonna be connected by these bonds. These are peptide bonds between each amino acid. And if you notice in the diagram, I've got them as different colors because not all amino acids are the same. We've got lots of types of amino acids. Now all amino Amino acids have the same general structure. They're gonna have an alpha carbon, this main carbon kind of in the center here. They're gonna have an amine group that has a nitrogen and some hydrogens. And it's gonna have a carboxylic acid group with another carbon, a couple oxygens as well. And then there's gonna be a side chain or an R group, which could be a lot of different things. And this determines the identity of the amino acid. So different types of amino acids have different R chains that are attached to that alpha carbon. But they all have this structure and they're all gonna be connected to each other through peptide bonds, which is where the carboxylic acid group of one amino acid is going to be bonded to the amine group of another amino acid, creating that peptide bond. Now in this diagram, I have what, 10 amino acids bonded together. In reality, proteins have maybe thousands and thousands of amino acids bonded together. So proteins are these huge complex molecules, but I'm not gonna draw that many amino acids on my diagram. It's gonna get a little out of hand if I do. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a dotted line and another amino acid here. And that just means that this continues on for however big that protein is. And these giant proteins, remember, they're gonna fold into all of these really interesting and unique shapes that are gonna allow them to do whatever their function is, such as being an enzyme or being a transport protein or a pump or whatever they do. All right, so let's start breaking this protein down. We've got a couple different enzymes we're gonna do. The first one I wanna talk about is pepsin. And pepsin is gonna be found in the stomach. It actually starts as an enzyme called pepsinogen. That gen part just means it's an inactive form that can become an active form. So pepsinogen will be converted into pepsin. And that conversion from pepsinogen into pepsin is done by acid. And so our stomach, of course, 
produces a lot of acid, and that acid is gonna convert the pepsinogen in the stomach into pepsin. And so this is all taking place in the stomach. We eat the food, it travels down the esophagus, comes into the stomach, and that's where protein digestion is gonna to start to occur. So we have acid converting pepsinogen into pepsin, and it's gonna to start to break some of those peptide bonds in the amino acids. So they get broken down, kind of like you've got a big Lego structure, and you're taking off piece by piece of that Lego structure. The individual Lego bricks would be the amino acids and the whole structure would be like the protein in that metaphor. So that's taking place in the stomach. From the stomach, the food will then move into the small intestine. There's gonna be pancreatic proteases in the small intestine or the duodenum of the small intestine that are gonna further break down the proteins that we've eaten. So this food's gonna pass from the stomach into the small intestine. You can see where the connection's gonna be right there. And that duodenum of the small intestine is connected to the pancreas. The pancreas has cells that are gonna produce all these pancreatic proteases. The pancreas actually produces enzymes for carbohydrates as well as lipids to break them down further. But you can see on here, this pancreatic duct and the enzymes made by the pancreas are gonna travel down the pancreatic duct into the duodenum of the small intestine where they're gonna further break down those proteins into their constituent amino acids. All right, so pepsin in the stomach as well as pancreatic proteases released by the pancreas into the duodenum those are breaking down the proteins. And so those will have broken the proteins down into their constituent amino acids here. But that's not gonna break it down into only amino acids. There's still gonna be some amino acids stuck together in what we call small peptides. And we're talking like two, maybe three amino acids still bonded together through a peptide bond. So we kind of have two products at this point individual amino acids as well as small peptides here. The individual amino acids, they're ready to be absorbed into the enterocytes and get them into the capillaries and therefore onto the liver. But the small peptides, they've got a couple more steps to go through. Before we get into that, let me add a little bit more green of my mucus layer just to distinguish what's happening where. Everything in the white up here is taking place before we get to like the mucus layer of the small intestine. Everything below this is gonna be taking place in the brush border, basically like on or right up against those microvilli. So the small peptides will be broken down by what's called amino peptidases. The amino there just means it's breaking it down from the amine side. Remember how the amino acids have a carboxylic acid end or an amine end. So these amino peptidases are gonna be breaking down or cleaving the peptide bonds starting with the amine end. We'll work to break these small peptides into their individual amino acids but not every one of those are gonna get broken down. So we'll still have some leftover small peptides. And at this point, we've got amino acids and small peptides ready to be absorbed into the enterocytes. So some of the small peptides have been broken down further into amino acids by the amino peptidases. And then we've got some that have avoided getting broken down altogether. They're still as small peptides. We're gonna absorb the amino acids as well as the small peptides into the enterocytes. But the small peptides, once they get in there, there'll be more enzymes ready to break them down. Those are gonna be the intracellular or in the cell peptidases. Now here's where the fun begins, the absorption part. Now the mechanism here is a little bit complicated, but I'm gonna break it down step by step. First thing we gotta do is we're gonna to have to get this through the luminal or apical membrane. We've gotta get the amino acids, small peptides through this luminal or apical membrane. And then we'll have to get them through what we call the basal membrane. And I'm gonna separate this into the amino acids part as well as the small peptides part. Now. In both of these, they're gonna use active transport, but they're not gonna use primary active transport. The amino acids will use secondary, and the small peptides will use tertiary active transport. They'll all start with the same stage, though. The primary active transport part of this is gonna be a sodium-potassium pump that's gonna be on the basal membrane of the enterocytes. And I've got one drawn right here, but these are gonna be sort of just lining this basal membrane. We have lots of these, and they're gonna be pumping sodium out and potassium in. They're gonna use ATP to do that, which is why this is active transport. It has to use energy. So we'll consume the ATP, and in the process of consuming the ATP, we pump a sodium out and a potassium in. Technically, we're pumping three sodiums out and two potassiums in every time we use one ATP. What this does is create a concentration gradient of sodium. We pumped so much sodium out of the cell they have very little sodium inside the enterocytes, but we have lots of sodium outside the enterocytes in the lumen of the small intestine. And molecules tend to flow from a high concentration toward a low concentration, and that gets rid of the concentration gradient, but we can use that gradient to power the secondary and tertiary aspects of this process. So we have a concentration gradient of sodium, very little sodium inside, lots of sodium outside. And that's gonna allow us to do this next stage. This is gonna be a symporter, meaning that it's moving two molecules in the same direction. It's gonna use the sodium concentration gradient to bring sodium in 
And every time it brings sodium in, it's gonna bring amino acids in. So we see that here, the sodium travels in, and that's gonna pump in an amino acid. No ATP is involved in that particular step. The ATP, the energy, was consumed in the first step, the sodium potassium pump, creating the sodium concentration gradient. Now as the sodium flows from its high to low concentration, that concentration gradient is gonna be used to pump in amino acids. And so we'll go ahead and keep doing that. Each time we bring in amino acid, we're gonna be sending more sodiums in, but I just didn't animate that in this uh, drawing here. So that's how we get amino acids into the enterocyte through secondary active transport. Primary active transport is using the sodium potassium pump to create the sodium gradient. And then secondary is gonna be using that sodium gradient in order to pump in the amino acids. The other thing we gotta do is bring in the small peptides. And like I said, we're gonna use tertiary active transport. So let's add in a couple proteins here. And remember, these pumps, the sodium potassium pump, the symporter for amino acids and sodium, as well as these new ones I'm drawing in, these are all proteins themselves. Proteins are the pumps and enzymes in our body. So this is gonna be a co-transporter for hydrogen ions and small peptides. And we've got another one we need to add, which is gonna be an antiporter. Antiporter meaning that they're transporting things in opposite directions. The sodium potassium pump was another antiporter. This antiporter is gonna bring sodium in and pump hydrogen out. So let's talk about this three-step process here. The sodium potassium pump is pumping sodium out. So we have a concentration gradient for sodium. Lots of sodium outside, very little sodium inside. The next step is gonna to be to use the sodium and hydrogen antiporter. It's gonna use the concentration gradient for sodium to power it, and that's gonna be pumping hydrogen out of the cell. So sodium travels in, and that pumps hydrogen out of the cell. So then at this point, we've got a concentration gradient for hydrogen. We've pumped out lots of hydrogen. So we have hydrogen outside, very little hydrogen inside right here. And we can then use that hydrogen concentration gradient to pump in the small peptides. So the hydrogen will come in, going from a high concentration to a low concentration, and that's gonna pump in these small peptides. So hydrogen coming in, small peptide coming in, and we'll do that with more hydrogen to bring in our other peptides. So we've got all these small peptides pumped in through this tertiary active transport mechanism. Again, pump sodium out, then use the concentration gradient to pump hydrogen out, then use the hydrogen concentration gradient in order to pump the small peptides into the cell. Now we'll use those intracellular peptidases to break these small peptides down into their amino acids. So we're gonna break those down using the intracellular peptidases. Now, at this point, we've broken kind of everything down into amino acids. We've had multiple rounds of these peptidases to break down the proteins and the small peptides down in the amino acids. There will be a small, a small, small percentage of these small peptides left over that still never got broken down. And we can actually bring those into the capillary as well, but that's a very, very small percentage. Most of this has been broken down into amino acids. Now we gotta get the amino acids from the enterocyte through the basal membrane into the capillary. And we'll do that through passive transport through facilitated diffusion. These amino acids aren't gonna pass just directly through the membrane. They're gonna pass through a protein channel. I've got three drawn in right here. And so those amino acids are gonna pass through those protein channels to get out of the enterocytes. And then from there, they'll passively transport between the gaps in the cells of the capillaries to get into that capillary and therefore into the vein, which is gonna connect with some other veins and go up through the hepatic portal vein into the liver. The liver then is gonna take these amino acids and reassemble them into the different proteins that our body needs. So that'll be the next place that they go. And then from there, they can enter into our blood circulation and get where they need to go. The amino acids, as well as the monosaccharides from the sugars that we eat, the carbs that we eat, those are all gonna end up to the liver right after this process. The lipids that we eat will work a little bit different. They'll go into a lacteal or a lymph vessel, and so they'll actually bypass the liver in their initial go through through the circulatory system, so they work a little bit different. But that's the general overview of the process of breaking down or digesting proteins into small peptides and amino acids, and then getting those amino acids and small peptides into the enterocyte, and then bringing those amino acids into our capillaries. That's a lot of information. Let's do a recap of this whole process. And then at the end of the video, you'll have a chance to pause it and practice this yourself. So we've got dietary proteins and endogenous proteins. Dietary proteins are the ones that we eat. Endogenous proteins are the ones that are already in our body, already in our small intestine. Pepsin from the stomach and pancreatic proteases, which are secreted by the pancreas, and then are gonna be in the duodenum or duodenum of the small intestine. Those are both gonna be breaking these proteins down one into their small peptides, as well as into individual amino acids. Now the small peptides then are gonna be broken down into amino acids by aminopeptidases. Those are gonna be found 
on the surface of the microvilli of our enterocytes, as well as some just in the brush border and the mucus. And then some of those small peptides will avoid, um, just by happenstance, will avoid the aminopeptidases and the pepsin and all those, they won't get broken down, and we're gonna bring those into the enterocytes as well. Now we're gonna use active transport to bring amino acids and small peptides into the enterocytes. That's gonna use secondary or tertiary active transport. For the amino acids, we use secondary active transport, where it's gonna start with the sodium potassium pump, it's gonna consume ATP in order to pump sodium out, and potassium in. That's gonna create a concentration gradient for sodium, meaning there's very little sodium inside of the cell, lots of sodium outside of the cell now. And then our amino acid and sodium symporter is gonna use that sodium concentration gradient to bring sodium in and therefore an amino acid in. The sodium is powering that pump, and each time a sodium comes in, that's bringing an amino acid into the cell. So let's bring all the rest of those amino acids in here. So we've used that sodium concentration gradient to power the secondary active transport pump right here. And again, that secondary one's not using ATP. We use ATP in the first step, and then the second step, we don't need ATP again. Now for the small peptides, we're gonna use tertiary active transport. The first step is gonna be that sodium potassium pump again, using ATP to pump sodium out. We now have a sodium concentration gradient. The sodium is gonna flow down the gradient from high to low concentration, and that's gonna cause the hydrogen to be pumped out. As that happens, we're creating a hydrogen concentration gradient. We have lots of hydrogen outside, very little hydrogen inside. That hydrogen ion concentration gradient is then gonna power this symporter here, where we're bringing hydrogen into the cell and small peptides into the cell. The hydrogen is powering this pump, and bringing in the small peptides. There's gonna be more peptidases inside the cell. We call them intracellular peptidases, and those are gonna break down those small peptides into their amino acids. Now we have a lot of amino acids inside of the cell. We've gotta get those out. So those are gonna pass through protein channels through facilitated diffusion. And then finally, there's gonna go into the capillary. Well, then they'll travel through veins into the liver where they can be processed. And like I said, it's a somewhat complex process. If you're trying to learn this stuff really well or for a test, that sort of thing, I highly recommend that you take a moment, pause the video, see if you can talk all the way through this whole process and explain it yourself, then you know that you know it pretty well. Here's the first diagram. I also have a second diagram with less detail on it to make sure that you know it really well, no labels or anything on here. Pause the video, see if you can do it using this less um, labeled diagram. Before we go, special thanks to these awesome patrons from my Patreon. Through their support, I'm really able to make better videos. I can spend more time doing this. I can upgrade my equipment, that sort of thing. My patrons also get access to all the diagrams in their full resolution, as well as some other resources. But really, honestly, most of the people on this list are supporting it because they uh, believe in free online educational content and want to support the channel. So huge thanks to this group of people. If you wanna know more about this stuff, I have other digestive system videos, including a carbohydrate digestion video. I'm working on a lipid digestion video. So check those out down here in one of these corners. I always get mixed up on that. There's a link to a playlist um, where you can access the rest of those videos. So yeah, thanks for watching. Good luck learning anatomy and physiology, and I'll uh, see you in the next video. Bye.